Realize that the MCAT is a big dog with a big bark, but no bite. By doing that, you're stopping yourself, looking at the answer choice, and you're convincing yourself that this is a better answer choice. All right, what's going on guys? Eric Med here, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how I got a 131 on the biochemistry and biological science section of the MCAT as a 3.0 GPA student. Before you even take, before you even start doing practice tests and doing the section banks and question packs for the MCAT in this section, you need to fill in your content gaps. So what are content gaps? Okay, so basically your content gaps are like, okay, you go over a question in the AMC, uh, let's say practice test, whatever, and it asks you about enzyme kinetics and you completely forgot the formula for enzyme kinetics or you completely forgot the difference between a uh, non-competitive inhibitor versus a competitive inhibitor what the km value goes down whether it goes up uh, vmax whether it goes down or goes up if you forget those things then you have content gaps before you even start practicing on any of the aamc material they give you online make sure you fill in those content gaps how do you fill in those content gaps this is where your kaplan books come in or the khan academy videos come in the lecture notes you have in your university your professors friends anything fill in those content gaps know the material know all the material if you want to list, if you're wondering like, okay, do I know everything that there is to need to know? Or do I need to know more? Do I have to look up more stuff? Then you could go ahead, go on the AMC website. I'll leave a link down below. Go and then every point in the biological, biochemical sciences section, make sure as soon as you read it, you know exactly what it's talking about. Okay, so this is very important for those discrete standalone questions. And also, like I think there's like 14 out of the 59 questions in this section. So this section has like 59 questions and 14 of those are just standalone questions without a passage. And then the rest of them has a passage, you read it, and then you answer questions based on the passage. So basically, a lot of times what's going to happen is that you're going to have pseudo discrete questions. So what that is, is like a passage they give you in this section and the question pertains nothing to the passage, or maybe it pertains to the passage very little bit, but that in order to answer that question, you need a lot of content knowledge. Is there high yield and is there low yield stuff? Is that true? <laughs> okay, if you have time, then I suggest you, uh, cause I had time to study for my MCAT because I realized like, look, like I have a 3.0 GPA. I didn't master the classes needed, the prerequisites for the MCAT. I didn't master those material like other people. So I got to spend a little more time to sort of master these topics for the MCAT. So if you do have time, like I did, then you want to master everything there is to know. Everything is high yield for you. Treat everything as high yield. If you don't have time, like let's say you're watching this video and you're one, two months out, then you focus on the high yield stuff and the low yield stuff, focus on it still, but not as much as the high yield stuff. Then there's a difference between high yield and low yield. But if you do have time, then everything is high yield. Boom, let's say you finished all your content gaps. You know everything there is to know. You go through the um, AAMC material. There is a section banks, the question packs, the uh, practice tests, all that stuff. You go through it. Now you're gonna see, okay, what did I get wrong and why did I get it wrong? This is like the most important part because this is the most important because here's where your score for these practice tests and question packs and section banks starts going up. You'll start off, because I started at like a 492 and then I kept going up, up and up and up. And eventually my last FL was a 518. If your content gaps are filled and you're still getting questions wrong, then what has to be going on is that you're not reading the passage correctly. You're not reading through it slowly and like understanding everything that's going on with the passage. So this, how do I understand this passage better? And don't get me wrong, like some of these passages, some of them are difficult. Some will say, okay, this gene gets knocked out and then this phosphorylates this and this phosphorylates this. And then without this, this has to miss missing the phosphate group. And then this domain is active, but at the same time, this other domain is like not active. And then this is a catalytic domain, uh, amino acid here is switched for this. So if this amino acid is switched over here, then what happens to the enzyme kinetics? Like literally those are like the passages, okay? But when you're reading those and you get tripped up because that's probably what's happening, read slowly and realize that the MCAT is a big dog. It's a big dog and realize that the MCAT, and I love this metaphor because it's so true and it helped me out a lot. Realize that the MCAT is a big dog with a big bark, but no bite. Okay. So basically like they'll, they'll throw like things at you. They'll throw these terms. They'll throw these diseases, infections that you've never heard of before. However, 
when you encounter these things, you know what you do know, and you don't know what you don't know. You know your content. So the question is going to utilize the content you used before to answer this question about something you don't know. So you know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. Also, for the MCAT in this section specifically, choosing the best answer is the best way to go. There's going to be times where there's multiple answer choices. Usually, this is what happens usually. There's four answer choices, okay? You can knock out two. Most of the time, you'll knock out one easily. Some, Most of the time, you can knock out two. When you knock out those two answer choices, you're left with two more left. And then these two answer choices, you're like 50-50 on between. If this happens to you, don't overthink. Go with your gut because trust that you went over your content review. Trust that and trust your gut because a lot of times what's happening is that you'll read through this passage, you'll get a little stumbled up, you'll get a little nervous, whatever, and you're not confident about the answer. You need to be confident about your answer. If you smell BS in the answer choices, you need to what is called put the ax down and eliminate that answer completely right away. Put the ax down if you smell BS in one of the answer choices and eliminate that completely. Okay, you're stopping yourself from looking at this answer choice and thinking in your head and rationalizing that this answer choice is correct and you trick yourself. You're literally, this, this is basic overthinking, which happens to me a lot. Which happens to like almost everyone. You're literally looking at the answer choice and you're convincing yourself that this is a better answer choice by staying on that question longer and longer and longer. Okay, so this is where you have to go with your gut. I promise you nine times out of 10, your gut will be correct. If your gut is not correct, then you didn't read the passage slowly. That's basically what this section is about. It's literally about your content review and dissecting these research articles that's been thrown at you, okay? I read it once and you're good, that's it. I'd rather have it where I read it slowly once and I everything sticks to my brain rather than reading it and barely understanding it and then going to the question and then trying to find back into the passage where if I could find this question, the answer to this question, like, no, that's not gonna work, okay? So last thing I wanna hammer in right now because this video is getting kind of long is how to choose the best answer for, these, for this section. Let's say I give you a question, okay? And this question, test your content knowledge here. Let's say I give you a question, okay? It's about separation techniques. The answer choices are TLC, thin layer chromatography, uh, ion exchange chromatography, and ion exchange chromatography, size exclusion chromatography. The question is, which is the best to separate proteins based on charge? And the passage gave you that this protein is some, it snuck it in there because a lot of times this will happen. They'll sneak it in there. You'll read, 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 and they'll throw a random fact like, oh, protein A has a positive charge. Blah, 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 blah. They'll like literally try to like sneak it in there so you can overlook it, okay? So in the passage just said, protein A has a positive charge. Which of the following is the best separation technique for this, this protein, okay? And again, the answer choices. Um, TLC, thin layer chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, and ion exchange chromatography, size exclusion chromatography. Okay, charge, protein. This is what should be going on in your head. If you want, I can make a whole video on how I dissect like these passages in the MCAT. If you want something like that, please comment down below. So what separates proteins based on charge? And we know that this protein has a positive charge. Okay, let's look at answer choices. TLC, thin layer chromatography, definitely not it. Does even, I don't even think it separates proteins. I remember in organic chem that we usually separate molecules based on polarities. Okay, so I'm gonna, Chop that down, gone. Thin layer chromatography is gone. Ion exchange chromatography. Makes sense, ions can be positive, negative charged. Makes sense, anion exchange chromatography. Anions are negatively charged particles. But the thing about anion exchange is that it uses cations as, as like the bead and these negative ions will stick to the bead. Okay, makes sense. So I'm left with two here. And the other choice was size exclusion chromatography. That is basically on molecular mass, molecular size. We're, we know that the protein has a, we know the protein has a positive charge. So that we can ax it out. Now we're left with two things. Ion exchange chromatography. Oh no, it both went down. Okay, that went down, but we're gonna keep going. Ion exchange chromatography or anion exchange chromatography. 
I know that anion exchange chromatography is a type of ion exchange chromatography. So what's the answer? That's kind of like two very similar questions. Okay, but what's the best answer? And the best answer is anion exchange chromatography because it's more specific. Ion exchange is very general. You want the correct answer, the most correct answer, not the best answer. They're both correct. However, the more specific anion exchange chromatography is the better answer because it was proven in the passage. Right here, like, share, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Till next time. Peace.